Yo creo que nadie sabe que era chido. <risa> <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna uh, talk again about um, diffusion in quantum chains. You something that you heard al already a number of times this week. So uh, this will be really um, a talk that try to give you the full details. I hope you that's what you want. But uh, okay, so you already seen a bit uh, this. Um, this equation this week, of course, I mean, this is the original equation of uh, generalized autodynamics. And then uh, the past years, I had a lot of research on trying to understand how to introduce dissipation and diffusive effects in, uh, in, uh, in this theory. And indeed, I'm going to just derive this diffusive dynamics and this diffusive transport from microscopic. And uh, as an application, we see indeed uh, how does it work to if you want to compute uh, really interesting quantities like what, what is the diffusion constant of a, of a chain. And uh, the, people, the people involved are these ones, uh, which are more or less all in the audience. <coughs> and in the, uh, Benjamin, Denis Bernard, where we did these papers on, it on, uh, on diffusion in, uh, in integrable systems. And then an Elieski, uh, Marco Medeniak, and Christoph Karash for where we looked a bit more at uh, SU2 antiferromagnetic chains, trying to reproduce or disprove all the results on spin and channel transport in uh, one dimensional compounds. I hope I will have time, but then I already told you something. Anyway, so uh, indeed, the, the focus of this will be all on transport. Of course, transport is when you plug two leads at your system and just want to understand what's the current that flow into your system of course if the system is uh, strongly interacting you expect to have some deviation from standard home law but okay usually experimentalists they, they probe uh, some uh, frequency dependence bias and then they want to know what's the current as a function of frequency they have a proportionality constant which is called conductivity sigma <coughs> and uh, we are going to just study this conductivity in the limit of zero frequency which means that you study the direct, direct current that flow into your system. And so what the, this conductivity at a small frequency usually behave like this. It can, it can have a divergence at zero frequency. Uh, and this coefficient of the divergence is called Drude weight. And uh, this somehow tell you that if you put a little bit of current in your system, this current is gonna flow, at least a part of it, weighted by the Drude weight, is going to flow to the other side with no dissipation, which is indeed what characterizes ballistic transport. And then there is a correction which is regular. It's called DC conductivity, which is indeed what characterizes standard si system. This is really like uh, what you study in your physics uh, electromagnetism course, and it's really like the, uh, the standard conductivity of a material. If, if your system is uh, generic, namely it has not a lot of conserved quantities, and it's not a superconductor. Usually, the Drude weight is zero. There is no ballistic transport. But there is finite DC conductivity, which are somehow due to the fact that you have diffusive transport in your system. Uh, uh, information scatter, and at some point, will get to the other side. Um, so what's the difference between integrable system and generic system? So I, I like to think the integrable system and generic system are a bit like this. So you can say integrable systems are a bit special because they have a lot of conserved quantities um, and they have some special behavior. For example, usually they have uh, a finite root weight. They allow for ballistic transport. But it's also true that integrable system can be used to a generic system because some, part, some properties of them are shared between integrable and generic system. Generic, from the point of view of transport, they usually have zero root weight, but they have finite conductivity. So the question that we asked last year is, if I give you an integrable quantum system, which, uh, of course, is special, but uh, it has many conserved quantities, can at least display some properties of a generic system, for example, diffusive dynamics and finite DC conductivity. And if you want to compute, so what you have to do, you have to compute this uh, DC conductivity, right? 
So just a very naive picture, I mean, going back to school, uh, what, uh, what is the relation of Einstein relation for, uh, for diffusion constants? What, what it tells you is simply that if you want to understand what is the diffusion constant in your system, usually what, the, what it means, it means that you're probing non-equilibrium dynamics of your system. You are doing a small perturbation, and then you want to see how this perturbation relaxes, right? What's the current induced by your local perturbation at this point? The proportionality constant is the diffusion constant. And if you want to compute that, you don't really have to do this non-equilibrium protocol. You can just look at how the system fluctuates in, uh, when it's a thermal equilibrium. So our system return at equilibrium from some standard perturbation is the same as our fluctuates, which means that you need to compute what, for example, in the case of Brannian motion, what's the velocity-velocity correlation at different time, integrated over all time and integrated over all space. And this, indeed, in like a phenomenological standard model, you can relate to, this, to the variance of your velocity times tau, which is the time, the usual time that uh, an excitation takes to relax. Right. That's the usual standard uh, Wikipedia expression for uh, diffusion constants. Okay, so now we want to do the same in a quantum system by means of uh, exact methods, so from microscopic. So in this case, we have uh, uh, some system with some local conservation law, right? That's all you care about. Local conservation law means that the, these are uh, conserved uh, quantities and they're given by some sum in space of some densities. And that's crucial because that's what defines a local conservation law. And usually there are eigenstate, the eigenstate of your system can be parameterized by some numbers, say theta, and when you apply this, this is just a state with one particle you want, theta. When you apply this operator to this particle, you obtain a single value, eigenvalue, sorry, here is theta. There is a function. This is like the single particle eigenvalue of this charge. And I is the index of the charge, one, two, three, four, five, and depending on how many conserved quantities you have. Okay? And what you want to compute is the current-current correlation, which is indeed, this will give you all the information you want about static transport. What is this? It's like correlation that tells you if I put at time zero some current for my local charge qj, a large time s, what, what is the current that I see? So usually this kind of uh, object is something that starts from some value, like one can be one, but this will be the j square at, the, at your equilibrium state, then relax to some steady the steady value that is usually zero. If it's not zero, it's because there is indeed a finite root weight in your system, which is indeed the large time limit of the current-current correlation. This tells you that the current that you put uh, at time zero, at infinite time, still is going around your system. So no dissipation. But the integral, so all the information you lost during this time, is actually what defines the DC conductivity, and if you want, the, um, your diffusion constant. Okay? So you want to compute this and this, just to have information about your DC transport. OK, so where do we want to compute it? On an equilibrium state, like, for example, a finite temperature. It's a legit question to ask what is the diffusion constant a finite temperature in your system. In an integrable system, you can parameterize your equilibrium state, not just by temperature, chemical potential, but you can really characterize them as quasi-particle states. So you have your, si your system at equilibrium, and you can see your system as a collection of a large number of quasi-particles. And these quasi-particles have certain uh, pseudo-momenta, theta, and, the, and since you're populating a lot of them, there is some distribution that tells you how many quasi-particles there are with pseudo-momenta theta. Okay? And this distribution is completely fixed if you, for example, want to have a thermal state under the request that, that you want some fixed energy and maximize entropy, right? So just going to use the notation, uh, I will use uh, rho p for the distribution of the quasi-particle. This, of course, is normalized to the total density of quasi-particle. Otherwise, it's also rho total, that is um, the total density of state, right? Because, of course, in a generic state, I'm not going to populate all the possible quantum numbers of, your st of my state. Uh, I, there is 
there's only row particle, and that's there is a total number of density tell me how many total possibility of quantum number I can I can put my theta. And there is a filling function, which is indeed rho particle divided by, sorry, rho total. Here it's rho total. And there is a density of hole, which is the rho total minus rho particle. Okay, this is just, a, I can parameterize the state with any of these functions. I will choose some mostly rho particle, but I can also choose rho the filling, which is like the equivalent of free fermionic filling. For the ground state, it will be 0, 1 the inside the filling. Okay, so what happens is when I do my, um, when I plug my current at time zero, at position zero, I create excitations, okay? And by creating excitation, it means that some of the particles in my system, some of the gauzy particles in my system, change their rapidity, or if you want, their momentum, or their energy, by order one. By order one, because it's a local operator. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna really change all these particles, just some of them. What is this change is usually called particle hole excitations. What does it mean? It means that if I have my equilibrium, I have my distribution of gauzy particle, now I plug my operator, and for example, one of these particle change is rapidity, like change your momentum, like scattering. And the, 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 the empty hole, the empty space that's left is called hole, so this is gonna be theta one hole, and the new, part, the new value is, gonna, is the particle, okay? And of course, I can imagine that by plugging this, I can create maybe one particle hole, but maybe also two, maybe also three, and so on and so on. And this is really what characterizes a truly interacting system that in a fermionic, for example, in a free fermion system, I would probably just create one particle hole. And that's, that, that's it. In a truly interacting system, as in interacting integrable model, usually the action of a local operator is non-diagonal in the space of particle hole, which means that you'd create a lot of them. But of course, you can imagine that sum in overall them, it will be some sum that converge. And this sum is what is called form factor expansion, which basically means that you plug a resolution of identity between your operators and you sum over all these excitations. Okay? And we want to do this sum because that's how we want to compute this current current correlations. Okay, so let's have a look at this sum, which is form factor expansion. So it's a sum over all possible particle hole that I create, m, from 1 to infinity, and I integrate over all the possible positions on the hole and on the particles. And I weight this, the measure is given by the density of particle when I want to create a hole, of course, because I, more particle I have, better it's easy to create hole there. And the other density is called by the density of hole, because less particle I have, easier to put new particles. And I have what are called form factors, talk about later. And then, of course, the phases, because now I, I have introduced a resolution of eigenstates. That's why I wanted to do that, because now I know how to write the time evolution and the space dependence of the states. And this is given by the, the, the dress energy and momentum of these excitations. And these are quantity that I can compute given my steady state. So these are quantity that depends non-trivially on the steady state, on which steady state I'm, uh, I'm choosing, for example, on the temperature. And usually, they are very, they are additive in particle hole. It means that the, the energy of a particle hole is the energy of the particle minus the energy of the hole. And if you have many of them, you just sum over them. By the way, here, the bullet here is just a notation to tell you that there are many here, generic number, m, okay? But I just have to sum over them. And what is the effective velocity of a hole? Actually, is, the, is, is really what is the group velocity tells us. It's just uh, the, the derivative of the energy respect to the momentum. And you will see that this will enter eventually the result because we will have to take the limit of particle that goes to the hole. What are these objects? Well, these are the most complicated objects. These are called form factors. And this has been the holy grail of research in uh, integrable systems since the past 30, 40 years. It's very hard to get these objects. For local operators, there's been a lot of study in field theories and uh, in chains, it's even harder, much less results. Um, but I moreover, here we are interested on not on the form factor on the vacuum, which means that we are not creating, our left state is not just the vacuum. We are not just creating few excitations on top of the vacuum. Our left state is the state with finite density of quasi particle. We want to create excitation on top of that, which makes this object even more complicated. So there are, no very much, there are almost no results on these kind of objects, but you see 
once you have them, you could get a lot of stuff. For example, this is how you compute this form factor expansion is how you compute correlation functions. For example, this is a plot uh, of uh, this, these are numeric results by the group of the Sebastian Co. <coughs> where uh, it could compute, for example, dynamic structure factor of spin chain by resumming form factor. This is zero temperature, though. Final temperature is even more hard. But anyway, this is, this is really what gives you a dynamic structure factor, something that you can measure in experiments. But you can also compute the post quench time evolution of local operators, because I'm not going to talk about that. But via this approach, which is called the quench action, you can see the time evolution of a local operator as simply given by the sum of all form factors of your local operator on top of your GG. And this gives you the dynamics of a local operator on, uh, after a quench. So if you have this form factor, you really solve 90% of, of the non-equilibrium problem in uh, interacting integrable models. So just to tell you, what are these form factors? So because you, know, most, uh, um, you hear a lot about off-diagonal matrix elements in, in, in systems and uh, I was discussing uh, last night with uh, Veer, and uh, I felt like they need to clarify this. Um, what are these objects? Basically, we are looking at the matrix element of a local operator between two states, but I'm also taking the fact that this state is a state with finite entropy. This is not a single eigenstate. This is, you see, you see when, when I gi once I give you a distribution of quasi-particle, you can always do a little bit of changes and get the same distribution, right? You can always do a macroscopic change, get the same distribution. And this is what defines the entropy of my state. Indeed, this state is supposed to reproduce finite temperature behavior, which means that it has to have a finite volume law, right? So what I'm actually doing this, I'm considering the matrix element between all eigenstates that reproduce this finite volume uh, um, state. So I'm summing over all possible entropic modification on the left and all possible entropic modification on the right, given this number of particle holes that I'm taking and renormalizing by the half of the entropy on left and right state. And once I have this, this is now well defined in the terminal limit because I can just take it multiplying times the number of particle holes that I put in my system L to the N. <coughs> of course, very hard to do this calculation very hard because, uh, of course, you have an entropic number of, of sums to do. So, OK, a lot of research has been done on this. Uh, so Benjamin Doyon has taught a lot about uh, finite density form factors uh, uh, more than 10 years ago. Um, I did. We, we, we came back to this problem because we wanted to compute diffusion. So we, we told a bit, uh, a bit of stuff about this. Recently, there has been a, some proposal, for example, by Pamphile Cuvello, th that uh, so I don't for, you, for the people that you hear, they know, uh, you in the field theory, in integrable field theory, there is a very specific way to get form factors, which is called bootstrap. You can, uh, if you want the form factor on the vacuum, which means you want to know what's the form factor of Q excitation on top of the vacuum, you can use a set of axiom to bootstrap the form factors. And now the question is, can we generalize this bootstrap not to vacuum form factor, but to finite density form factor? Very non-trivial, but at least this is a good step in this direction. But we didn't compute the full form factor. We just uh, used some, uh, some uh, properties that was enough to compute diffusion. And um, what are these properties? OK, so here is our form factor. Uh, I will the red part is the fact that now you are looking at scattering of quasi particle not in the vacuum but in some C of quasi particle. This is your background. Okay. So first property is continuity equation. This is the fact that if I give you the form factor of a charge, you also know what's the form factor of the current, because there is a continuity equation, right? That relates the, the charge with the current. Dt dx. Sorry, dt of Q is simply minus the X or J. If you plug this relation in the form factor, you see that basically this two form factor must be written as uh, a function, a common function, times either the difference of, of momentum for the excitation, for in the case that you look at the charge, or times the difference of energy, in case you're looking at the current. And this is very nice because once I know, for example, the form factor of the charge, I can reconstruct the form factor of the current simply by this relation. 
this is very generic relation, no assumption on this. Then, then some assumption. Okay, you would like to understand what are the poles of this form factor. What does it mean, the poles? Okay, consider, for example, a two particle hole form factor. This means that there is a ho two holes that scatter and create two new particles. What happens when one of the particles is the same value of the hole? Okay? This usually produces singularity because you have a lot of response for this, for this senior. And this is actually, if you, look, you, if you read in the books of uh, field theory and bootstrap equation, they tell you that this process should be equivalent to the process where the, this hole doesn't interact with the rest, just go by its own, minus the process where the hole scatter with the first particle and the second particle. And indeed, this is one of the so-called form factor axiom. It's called the kinematic pole axiom. And it tells you that, uh, it basically writes an equation this, that tells you that the form factor with uh, m particle excitation, when you send one particle to the same value of the whole, is equal to the form factor with less particle excitation times the phase shift accumulated by this whole when it's scattered with the rest. What we did is simply that we dressed. We dressed the phase shift because we take into account the fact that when this hole does this uh, round, it's actually scattered with all the other particles in the background. You mean, what if now as a background I choose the, the ground state? No, but wait a minute, the ground state, wait, when I say vacuum, I really mean vacuum. Huh? So the usually the, the form factor axiom are for vacuum. It means you only, your left state has zero quasi particles. A ground state here would be a, a field, uh, it would be still a non-trivial background. So is this what you mean? No, it would, uh, so you see basically now the, it, it depends, the dressing of the scattering kernel matrix that you have here depends on the type of background you have. If you have vacuum, the dressing would be trivial, would be just one. Yeah. If you have uh, another state here, like, uh, I don't know, final temperature state or even the ground state, then uh, it would be non-trivial. So what is the dressing, actually? The dressing is, uh, I give you a function, like, for example, the scattering matrix, and the way you dress it is simply by applying an operator to this, uh, 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 this is a continuous operator, but you can really see it as an operator, to this function. This operator is usually one minus the scattering kernel times n. n is the occupation number. So you see all the information about the background goes here. So you change the background, you change the dressing. So this is a, an assumption. We conjecture this formula. And then we check if it could work. <coughs> Finally, last property. You want to know what are the one particle hole form factors. And these are all the scattering process where you have one hole that scatter and produce a particle, okay? And you are interested in the, in the limit, in the so-called hydrodynamic limit, because eventually we want to do hydrodynamics, which means that the particle really deviates a tiny bit from the hole. And in these limits, the, there are some arguments to show us that actually the, this form factor is given by the dress single particle uh, value for the charge. And by continuity equation, you can reconstruct the form factor for the current, which is just the dress eigenvalue times the effective velocity. Okay, so I'm sorry if this sounds very technical. It's probably mostly uh, for the aspect. I hope at least I give you a flavor. Now we have a set of properties for this form factor of finite density that we use to compute time time uh, current current correlations, which is what you need to compute diffusion. And I hope I convince you that this object now will be given by sum in terms of excitation one particle hole, two particle hole, three particle hole. And what we find is that. Uh, one particle hole is really what gives the large time limit of the current current correlation, which is the root weight. And the two particle hole instead is what gives you diffusion, is what gives you dissipation. And the interesting thing is that if you care about the time and space integrated correlation, you only need one and two particle hole because all the rest gives zero contribution. And uh, so uh, if you want to understand this, we can look at the uh, expression that you find for the two particle um, contribution. Okay, so what does it mean to particle hole? It means that you are uh, integrating over all possible value of the two holes that scatter with the two particles, okay? 
But of course, you're integrating over space and time, which means, if you remember here, there, is, there was a phase, right? e to i x p minus t epsilon. With this, generate two delta function, a delta in momentum, a delta in uh, energy. So what is this telling you? Actually, that if you, when you're looking at diffusion, you're looking at all elastic processes. You're conserving energy, you're conserving momentum. If you only have two particles in the scattering processes, these two constraints completely fix your the output, namely completely fix the, the value of the particle. They just tell you that the particles are either the same as the whole, so just uh, they go through, or they are a permutation, right? There's no other solution for these two constraints when you have two particles. And this is great because now if you remember, this form factor have poles, this form factor have poles exactly at when particle and whole collide, right? They're the same. And this constraint is really then forcing you to sit at these poles. Problem is that this form factor also are proportional to the energy difference. And you see, here we have a delta in energy, and here we have energy. If this guy would be regular, basically this contribution would be zero. And this is exactly what happened for a higher particle hole. Because for higher particle hole, these two constraints do not fix completely the output. They don't completely fix the particle. They don't force the particle to be really at the poles of the hole. And therefore, this delta cancel with this zero. <coughs> but for two particle hole, this constraint completely fixes you the integral at the poles, and this singularity cancels with this singularity, and that's why diffusion is finite. <coughs> and so, what is the picture? The picture is that if we look at the space integrated current current correlator, this object decay goes to some final value, and this final value is the one given by the fact that you have stable one particle excitation in your system with move with the effective velocity, which is indeed the group velocity of your hole. And this is what gives you the root weight. But the dissipation, the fact that this correlator goes to zero, is given by the presence of two particle hole excitation, which is really typical of an interacting system. You would not have this in a free system. You would have just a constant value. <coughs> and uh, at this uh, two particle excitation that you need are actually the only one that conserve energy momentum. So they're exactly when the two output are either the same or a permutation. Are there a question about this? Okay, that's a very good sign. Uh, what? How much time do I have? Ah, huh? half an hour. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So. Um, Does this remain true at zero temperature? At zero temperature... Um, is it also true that higher uh, particle hole excitations do not contribute? Or? But the problem is that at zero temperature, uh, this also becomes zero. The two particle contribution also becomes zero. Okay. But, uh. yeah. but this is uh, because you are integrating over all time. In a sense, um, at zero temperature, it's impossible to put the particle at the same position at the hole because you are completely filled, right? So you, um, you have a Fermi C and you, the Fermi C is full of particle and the rest is full of hole. So the only non-zero non process you can do is really when the particle move with some final momentum outside the Fermi C. So this, the only pro point where this could be finite is really at the edge of the Fermi C. But this is zero measure. So um, this would be zero. But lit you give a little moment, you, you, you integrate a little, not really on the wall system size, but with some, and then it would be fine. So indeed, I don't know exactly how to take this limit. So far, this would just give you zero. Which somehow tell you that diffusion constant at zero temperature is zero. But okay. Uh, can go back to this. Um, okay, other question. Okay, uh, good. So even if you didn't follow up to now, you can uh, just uh, recover by, say, by notice that, okay, this, all this was to tell you that with this a bit maybe complicated machinery um, of form factors, you, you can resum them. You are lucky because you don't need to resum an infinite number of excitations. You can sum only two. But 
nevertheless, you arrive to an expression to this conductivity, DC conductivity, okay? Of course, you also got an expression for the root weight, but the root weight somehow was known already. These are the first papers of the analyzer dynamics. It was obvious how to take it, so it was just nice that we recover with one particular excitation. But the new object is this, this sigma conductivity, this DC conductivity, which is a matrix, right? It's a matrix where the index, again, are the index of your charges. So this is asking, for example, uh, index ij is basically what's the current that flow into your system or type j when you have inserted some, some current of type i. Okay? There's no reason why this should be diagonal. And you have an expression for this, and what is this expression? Basically, it's telling you that diffusion processes are like a random walk in the space of charges, right? There is a, a kernel that tells you what's the probability of changing charges from some value to another. And we are going to write it in a rapidity space because charges and rapidity are just the same. <coughs> so this is a matrix. So I can extract from this just the matrix or, diffu or diffusion matrix, which is indeed tells you that these are the all the diffusion constants of your system. And you can write them as a, a bilinear kernel in uh, rapidity theta and alpha. So these are the, these I, h i and h j are the single particle eigenvalue of the charge i and the charge j. And this kernel tell you indeed what's the pro somehow really like what's the rate for changing some charge uh, alpha to some charge theta. And this kernel indeed has the as the form you expect, which is really like a, a Markov a Markov matrix. This is you see it's um. It's really like uh, the, the matrix of a Markov process where you have some uh, rate to jump from some rapidity theta to some rapidity alpha. And this rate is given by this expression. And you see, basically, it's a user form. Now you have like a total uh, prob probability of jumping, which is the diagonal part, which is just the integral of this function, minus the probability of jumping, which is given by this rate. What is this? This rate is uh, given by all the information that you have put in your uh, reference state. If you are like a finite temperature, it tells you basically that the probability that a quasi particle that is moving with some rapidity theta jump to some uh, uh, quasi particle with rapidity alpha is given by the, the, the amount of quasi particle you have with uh, quasi uh, rapidity theta times, of course, one minus uh, occupation, which is what gives you the statistics times the absolute value of the difference of velocities. Because of course, if these two quasi-particles are going with the same velocity, they will never scatter, they will never change rapidity. You need to have, for example, two quasi-particles that come with some rate given by their velocity, they scatter and maybe they change rapidity. And the probability square, which is basically the, the scattering matrix. It's the scattering matrix of this, rapi of this rapidity driven by the presence of a non-trivial background, as I showed you before. And this is, you could really simulate, you could really discretize this rapidity and simulate this Markov matrix, actually would be interesting. And this really, really would give you like some random process of uh, scattering at diffusive level for your quasi-particles. And, um, and why this is good? Because of course now we can compute physical observable like diffusion constants. Okay, so <coughs> for example, let's look at our uh, favorite model, which is uh, the XSG chain. XSG chain, as we've seen uh, like a thousand times this week, it's the access model for uh, interacting spin with some uh, delta. And this model, uh, it's interesting because depending how you tune delta, it shows different type of transport. It can show ballistic, that, as I told you before, is when the root weight is finite. But if delta is bigger than one, or equal, uh, actually also large, it doesn't show you ballistic. The root weight vanish. The root weight vanish, and at delta, for example, equal two, you can run the MRG, and you can, for example, you can join, uh, you can take left and right state, which are two states of uh, little unbalance of magnetization. We are total magnetization zero. So you do like uh, a bit of a magnetization on the left and a bit of minus magnetization on the right, and you look at the profile of the current, and this profile grows with square root of t which indeed tell you that there is diffusion. So the claim is that uh, if, you are a, if you are a chain, a finite temperature, and are filling, the spin dynamic is diffusive. 
Okay? It's diffusive, and there is a constant, and there's a diffusion constant, which I'm going to call this spin, which you like to compute. And this was indeed why we had to do all this stuff before. <coughs> and uh, it turned out that uh, the diffusion constant of the spin, if you use this result, you can see it. I mean, basically now what you want to do is to take this result that we have found for the, for the diffusion matrix and focus on an So, of course, this is very generic, right? This is for a generic integrable model. But you want to restrict to, like, an XZ, and you want to compute the spin diffusion constant, OK? And um, it turned out that this is related, the spin diffusion constant is related to how the, the largest Gaussian particle fluctuates under scattering with all the Gaussian particles. I'm going to tell you what does it mean. So in a <coughs> spin chain like this one, XZ, you have not just one type of Gaussian particle, you have many. Okay, what does it mean? It means that I can create magnons, okay, magnons, but uh, you can also create bound states of them, okay? Bound states because the interaction is non-trivial. What does it mean? It means that uh, a thermal state, it's a state where you specify all the, for example, how many magnons you have, how many bound states, or two, or size two, how many bound states, or size three, and so on. Namely, you have to specify their density in a rapidity space, right? And this completely fix you the state. Then, okay, if you want to compute what's the expectation value of a local charge on the state, you basically have to sum over all the family, different family, families of, uh, of a quasi-particle weighted by their distributions times the single particle eigenvalue for your charge. For example, what's the energy of the state? The energy of the state will be the energy of the magnet times the density integrated plus the energy of the bound states type 2 integrated and so on. And um, the crazy stuff is that um, if you're looking at concert quantity like energy, like um, what else, the, the next one and all this, they are written as some of all these contributions. But the spin is somehow sick. S spin and charge, if you're looking at a more complicated model like Hubbard, uh, it's an isolated mode. And spin actually asks you to, uh, in order to determine the value of the magnetization, you need to take the large, the large Gaussian particle limit. So it tells you that basically uh, what is relevant to determine the expectation value of the magnetization in such a state, it's how the contribution of this Gaussian particle decay to zero. So of course, this, this is normalized, right? So um, the contribution, the amount of Gaussian particle larger and larger size usually goes to zero. You don't have Gaussian particle that have uh, infinite, infinite um, length because this, you see, I mean, these are like almost non-physical excitation. So their, their density is zero. But for the point of view of spin, it's important to know actually how this density goes to zero and how they fluctuate. And it turned out that uh, if you also want to compute the spin diffusion constant, you actually have to look at how these bound states, which are infinite size, they uh, diffuse due to the fact that they scatter with all the other quasi-particles that are present in your background. And uh, <coughs> what, the yes, what I mean, this, uh, was the particle with infinite size is again you have to interpret it in the limit. So there's gonna be some very big cluster of spins that are like a quasi particle, and there will go, there's gonna be an effective diffusion constant for them. And this delta n infinity actually the way you find it is really by taking how the occupation number of the quasi particle fluctuates. Uh, so s now is my index for the quasi particle type which indeed is a bit like the spin of the Gaussian particle, and you take this limit of large s, normalizing with like s squared. Because of course, this guy goes to zero, but you need to know how it goes to zero. And this tells you how spin fluctuates. And this finally gives you an expression for the spin diffusion constant. The spin diffusion constant is then given by all these processes, all these processes where these big clumps of spin oscillate due to all this scattering, weighted by the effective scattering matrix between 
the s infinity was a particle, this guy, and all the s prime, where I sum over all the s, s prime, namely over all these processes. Namely, again, times their effective velocity and the mm, amount of was a particle with spin s prime present in your background. And okay, so it sounds a bit uh, technical, but this is uh, this is really like a very rare example of an exact expression for a diffusion constant in an interacting system. And uh, up to now, it was not clear how to compute that. And so finally, we can make plots. <coughs> we can make plots of a diffusion constant. So this is supposed to be the spin diffusion constant of an XAZ chain as a function of delta at infinite temperature. So what I'm just, uh, for convenience, I'm just choosing some background, which is the um, infinite temperature state. And I want to see how the spin fluctuates on this infinite temperature state. And, uh, and this, is the uh, this is the diffusion constant that I obtain. And now I can finally compare with numerics, as uh, everyone wants to do. <coughs> and numerics, unfortunately, don't fit. Okay. No, OK, they almost fit. The problem is that uh, you can imagine that the diffusion constant is something that depends really on the time integral over a lot of time, right? You really have to know how spin fluctuates over a long range of time. And as you know, numerics for a quantum system, which is basically time dependent on G, have the problem that if you increase too much the time, the entanglement in your system increases too much, bond dimension is too large, and you have to truncate at the, at the finite time. So it means that num what effectively numerics can do is to compute this integral over time for your current current correlation only at a finite time, max time. Okay? These are the best data that we have so far, uh, the data of Christoph Karash. And um, if you want, you can see them really a lower bound for diffusion. But if you try to extrapolate the, the behavior of the correlation from numerics at large time, you actually get much better agreement with uh, the prediction that we have. So unfortunately, at the moment, there is still no uh, efficient and, and, a, and good way to extract diffusion constants for a quantum system uh, any numerical approach that would extract this diffusion constant from a quantum system. It's kind of crazy that in order to compute such classical dynamics, you need to increase so much the amount of entanglement you put in, in your simulation. But so far, it's how it is. If you have ideas how to improve this, it would be great and compare with the, this first exact result. But OK, questions? Of course, now you, uh, it's quite you, by looking at this um, plot, you can notice that the diffusion constant a large delta goes to a constant, which is also Um, a large delta goes to a constant, which is also somehow surprising because you may expect that this model, a large delta, is a free model, right? If you take the large delta limit of this chain, this well, you can, in principle, neglect this term, and then you get back with the, with the Ising chain, and the Ising chain is a free model. But this, actually, you're not allowed to do it you are because you're probing non-equilibrium dynamics, and that, indeed, you see that a large delta diffusion constant is actually finite. The system is not trivial. There is still non-trivial mixing despite the large delta. But more, more interesting, what happens when you actually send delta to 1? When you send delta to 1, you see the diffusion constant actually diverge. Didn't show it use, but believe me, diverge as 1 over square root of delta minus 1. And this is, you already heard in the talk of uh, NA, is really what um, shows that a delta equal 1, namely in the xxx or isotropic case, there is not diffusion for the spin. There is super diffusive transport. This is, was uh, nicely shown uh, by numerics um, in uh, the previous paper I showed you that a group of Tomas present, but also there is a new one this year with improved numerics, where you can really see that by, uh, by doing this uh, different, uh, by basically probing the linear response spin uh, transport of uh, the XZ chain, you get a uh, diffusive transport, namely the, the current at uh, position zero 
if you integrate it, increase with uh, t to the one half. But if you actually put delta equal one, the current time equals zero, increase with t to the two third. And uh, new numerics seem to suggest that uh, if you actually look at the um, spin auto uh, dynamical correlations, this, this object uh, goes as t to the minus one half with some uh, universal scaling function that is only function of x over t to the one half, which somehow is what you expect for a diffusive system. This is, of course, this is by the way, it's infinite temperature, but does temperature doesn't change as long as it's fine. And uh, instead, at delta equal one, the dynamical correlation seems to show t to the minus two third times the universal scaling function of KPZ dynamics, which is a, a scaling function not of x over t to the one half, but of x over t to the two third. Okay, so this this so far are numeric results, and there is not much of analytical prediction. The only analytical prediction, the solid analytical prediction we have, it's really to show that the delta equal one diffusion constant does diverge. And by the way, you can use the, um, the way how the diffusion constant diverge at delta equal one to do some scaling theory and get this exponent two thirds. But that's the maximum you can do. It would be great now to <laughs> prove this expression. This is, by the way, very uh, shocking because, uh, um, okay, you would never expect that the system, which is integrable, it would display the same behavior that chaotic, non-integrable model display. Okay, you could say, okay, diffusion, diffusion maybe is fine because eventually there are some works that have shown that in order to have diffusive transport, you don't strictly need chaos, but you need at least some weak mixing between the modes. And that's what we have. We have mixing between the modes, and that's why, it, despite the mode is integrable, there is still diffusion. But KPZ, so far, it's only known to appear in classical systems which are chaotic, which are non-integrable. When this is all the machinery that you heard by uh, uh, Zamato Monday that, that use uh, the non-linear fluctuator dynamics. So here again, we have an integrable system that display KPZ. So if this is confirmed, it would be really good. <laughs> but okay, um, how much time? Ah, two half minutes. 12 minutes, okay, 12 minutes, okay. Um, okay, so indeed, I actually don't need much more time uh, because, um, so this is the predi one of the predictions we did. Um, I just wanted to mention uh, the most recent, um, most recent work, but in a sense, this is just a repetition of what uh, NA already told you. Because again, now that we have this exact result for uh, diffusion, we can go back to problems of the 90s and the early 2000s, where people were to want to understand what was the transport dynamics in uh, not integrable chain, but in non-integrable chain. For example, in Aldane spring one chain. Of course, this is non-integrable, so you don't know what to do. Uh, but thanks to the work of Africa Aldane, that actually shows this great result that the low energy theory of this model is described by a field theory. And this field theory is called nonlinear sigma model. And it's actually a field theory very famous, also in high energy because of its relevance for QCD. But the point is that uh, then zoomological show that this field theory is integrable. Okay, so it's integrable, which means that you can use, um, that you can use the machinery that we already introduced, we just introduced to uh, compute transport coefficients. And uh, there were some um, conflicting statements about this, the transport in this system because since the, the model is so hard, since uh, it's so hard to compute dynamical quantities even in integrable model, people developed effective, mod uh, effective theory to tackle the problem. And one of them is a very successful semi-classical theory of Sartep and collaborator where they were basically saying, okay, I don't, want to, I don't want to use the fact that this model is integrable because, any, because this complicates too much my calculation. I just want to use the fact that if I am a very low temperature, I just need to use the very low line excitation because this, by the way, the, my system has a gap, at least for spin one chains. 
I only want to use the low energy excitations and, uh, and since I'm only looking at the dynamic scales, I'm just going to use the zero momentum part of my scattering matrix. And this is all you need, all the input you need to do semi-classical. <coughs> and uh, they had prediction for diffusion constant and uh, also NMR relaxations and uh, we wanted to check them. Now that finally we have an exact method. There were also the great works of all people working on integrable models, uh, Zvelik, Affleck, Koenig, and also people in Saclay at the time, and Jolie Kerr. Uh, also, people that basically, they cons instead, they wanted to use the fact that nonlinear sigma model is an integrable model and uh, use form factor expansion to get dynamic correlations. And uh, of course, this also was non trivial because um, at the time there were no results absolutely on finite density form factor. So the way how these calculations were done was by expanding over vacuum form factors and trying to resum the finite temperature series. And strangely, well, uh, I don't know why, but I mean, uh, this pre prediction from semi-classical was somehow in contradiction for some results on the prediction of integrable model. So what we did is that we use the machinery that I just introduced you to compute uh, drawed weights and DC conductivity. And basically, we um, confirm or disprove some of the res previous results. And in particular, we, saw we, c we could finally check when semi-classical approximation is correct. And it turned out that semi-classical is correct whenever you have, don't have any whenever you have anisotropic interaction and of course whenever you have a gap and uh, but it's correct in predicting a zero root weight this also was a very very controversial statement that semi-classical approximation basically was predicting that there was zero root weight in the system but some of the results from integrability were seemed to, to point out final root weight but I don't know anyway we confirm zero root weight and, but the surprising thing, and this was not captured by semi-classic, uh, is actually there is zero to the weight, so no ballistic transport, but there is super diffusion if your interactions are isotropic. So the diffusion constant can diverge, and this is indeed uh, what I showed you before, last, uh, last day, it can diverge for models like, the, well, for the low energy effect theory, for example, of this model, which indeed it's a model with isotro uh, isotropic interactions. And this happened for any temperature and uh, zero magnetic field. Okay? And um, so in a sense, the, the lesson that somehow we learn is that um, there are violations of semi-classic, which is, okay, you could expect because somehow it's an approximate theory, which does not take into account the full complexity of the, qu of the, of the quantum scattering matrix. And this quantum scattering matrix is actually what produces all these tower of bound states, okay? And super diffusion is really due to the fact that you need to take into account the fact that all these quasi particles can create large bound states, and these large bound states carry more and more diffusion, such that, that if you sum over all them, the diffusion is infinite and it's super diffusion. But this semi classic neglected only took the simplest excitations. And there is also violation or uh, somehow like up maybe apparent violation so far of form factor expansions because one of the idea that was used in the uh, by doing a vacuum for factor is that you don't know how to fully resum all over all the thermal excitation so you need to truncate the sum over thermal excitation but still using the fact that you have a gap the gap is supposed to suppress thermal excitations but what we see by using finite density for factor is actually this is not the case. There is a non-trivial dressing of the form factor even in the presence of the gap. And this somehow changes all your, your results and give you indeed this kind of predictions. <coughs> but um, I think the most exciting uh, of behavior is really the fact that uh, diffusion constant is infinite, which seems to point out the fact that uh, even uh, in a non-integrable model like this one, Despite the fact that, uh, I mean, even in an integrable model, just the fact that you have isotropic interaction can lead to superdiffusion and maybe to KPZ, universal dynamics. <coughs>
And just to back to right, okay, okay. And all I uh, told you so far is uh, just doing linear response, okay, and just doing linear response and just uh, probing the uh, the um, just uh, doing a small perturbation to your system and see what's the current that flows to the system. And this is what you need to study transport tra transport coefficients, okay. You could go back to hydrodynamics. This is nice because this was the first slide. Uh, and write what is the prediction for the generalized dynamics with this diffusion coefficient. So now you learn what is this uh, symbol. This is the diffusion uh, kernel, which is this object that basically is sim incorporate the fact that uh, inside the Euler hydrodynamics, which is just account for particle propagation, from time to time, because the particles scatter, and they may exchange their rapidity with the diffusion kernel. And this does not affect, actually, the effective velocity, because the effective velocity is really due to the, um, all the microscopic scattering process in this background. These are uh, higher level scattering processes that actually lead to, if you want, square root t broadening of the quasi-particle trajectory while they are propagating with some effective velocity given by the finite background. And the way how the quasi-particle scatter, it's really parameterized by not the real scattering kernel of, the, of your theory, but the dress one. Because now you're doing hydrodynamics, you can assume, for example, that here there is some uh, modulation of temperature, okay? And the scattering, the way how quasi-particles scatter locally in each fluid cell will depend on, for example, the effective temperature that is present in each cell. And by the way, this term now uh, violates conservation of entropy, and uh, this result is very, known, very well known in, the, in uh, hydrodynamics, this term actually generates entropy. Generate entropy that has to be understood with the fact that it's a term that's moving out a small uh, variation, like a fine scale variation in your Euler hydrodynamics, and therefore increase entropy in this sense. You, you lose information about tiny modulation inside each fluid cell. <coughs> okay, so uh, just to conclude, I hope that I give you like slightly different uh, flavor of GHD than you saw in these previous days. And, um, and the take home message is that you can also see GHD as a theory for particle excitations. These particle excitations are all the, the excitation that you can locally create on top of your local steady state. And that Euler, the Euler scale GHD, it's fully given by the so-called one particle hole. And this is, by the way, the reason why even free system, even free fermionic system, have a, a, a finite Euler scale dynamics because they can always create one particle excitations. But if you want to go to diffusive scale, this is a theory that incorporates two particle hole. And this is present only if there is finite interaction in your system. Of course, the question is what happened to higher number of particle holes? I believe that this is a, would give you a hierarchy of excitation that would completely define the scales at which you want to look your system. Because this is a scale where uh, the Euler scale is where basically space and time are very large and space is the same order of time. Diffusion scale is where Space, it's a bit more smaller, it's like square root of time. That if you actually want to see the si look at the system where space is even smaller, you should include higher number of particle excitations. And this has been, uh, okay, my dream since a while, but the fact that two particle holes, now you, you understood that really these are what you need to have some non-trivial mixing in your system. So if you want to break integrability, you should expect that at least in the first non-trivial order should be some two-particle hole in your system induced by the inter the st some external perturbation, for example, like this trap that Benjamin introduced or some uh, uh, non-trivial interaction among the quasi-particles. And the other take-home message is that, okay, will the dynamics of this quasi-particle, whenever this is all finite, it's uh, what you expect from... Uh, from a typical fluid, you have some uh, convective transport and some diffusive uh, smearing out. But, uh, um, but actually, there are some degrees of freedom, 
like spin and charge, that can be anomalous. That is not just diffusion. It has different classes of transport, different dynamical exponents, like this two-thirds. And then this is, I think, what, what excites me is really that it could be that integrable models, like integrable chain, are, uh, could be really a representative model of huge universality classes for transport to one dimension. They could not just be properties of integrable models, but they could really describe some universality class, like, for example, diffusive, of super diffusive. In a sense, is superdiffusion only related to integrability, or we are just seeing superdiffusion in an integrable model, but we actually there is a whole class of models around them that also display superdiffusion. This is, I think, it's the one of the most exciting coming here. And uh, with this, I'm done. So I thank you for the attention. Very nice talk. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, right, okay. I started the front, but I have some.